Roy McGregor, look at this. Woo! Woo! Wow. Are you excited? Yeah, very excited. Yeah? Well, yeah. So, trepidatious, so, too. I mean, you don't know how many people did I leave out? How many important stories did I forget? How many people that were are expected to see their name in there not going to see it? So. Oh, Roy, like, I, I got I got so many questions. We could do, like, a three-hour interview with this. But, but, but even randomly, I just got this question right off the bat. Did you keep good notes throughout your life? Because you do remember everybody in here. Like, there's yeah. names everywhere. Everybody's saying that to me. Yeah. Did you keep, no, oh, no, I never kept any notes. Really? Wow. Well, okay. That's incredible. <laughs> so, why a memoir? You've written, you've told me more books than you can remember or more books than you've even read. Yeah. I remember. That? And uh, so you've now written a memoir. Was this a memoir in the making years ago or was it just epiphany you had like a year ago or two years ago or like two months ago? Well, Kevin, I retired from the Globe and Mail uh, and I had 50 years in the business as of 19, or as of 2022. I started in the business in 1972. It was our 50th wedding anniversary coming up. And uh, I thought uh, I, I flew it by the publisher. They were quite keen. So I went ahead with it and it took longer than I expected, a full year longer. But that, it's okay. That's a long time because like you, you spit books out like like <laughs> like a hockey player spits saliva out on the ring. <laughs> true. True enough. <laughs> but we had a we had a family tragedy. My wife passed away. So yeah. it, it really threw through the book and through obviously threw me off. Still still does. But, yeah. But it, yeah. The book's I, I, love, I love I love the chapter at the end. Um yeah, I, and it was a it was a solid chapter. It, it wasn't sort of what you would, you know, hear from many other people. It was it was you. I've admired your writing for years. Uh, I loved Artie Lawrence growing up because of his nature writing. I loved Farley Moe because of storytelling. I love you know all these other writers, but it was you that actually really inspired me to write. Like you were good. A, you're a good writer. Wow, right? thank you. Yeah, well, you are. You really are. I mean. Think about raisin, it. I'll, raisin I'll, toast I'll, you. Oh yeah, that's right. It's a whiskey fireside chat. Oh, I've got a good one too. Look at this. Oh, yeah. much better than mine. Much it's better. It's pretty peaty, I, and I'm still working on it. I I, I had it on a, a last canoe trip, and I didn't finish it, so I'm still working on it. What, what you began this morning? No, no. That actually, I've had this for over <laughs> months. This is this is so good of whiskey that you only have a little bit. Little. Yes. Yeah, it, it smells the house out um with pete all right so i got some questions I, i'm gonna keep focus here i've got notes your mother tied you with your way, a tree when you were young yes you were that hyper <laughs> well i guess so but what happened was i was born in whitney which is a very small village on the edge of algonquin park and at uh, four days of age she took me to lake of two rivers in algonquin park so i spent, spent my my first of many many summers there at our grandparents place he was chief ranger of the park Time came for my older brother to go to school. We lived outside of Whitney in a little, little tiny hamlet called Airy. Five houses, six houses, uh, really very little going on. And uh, because my older brother would have had to walk a couple of kilometers down the tracks to school at Whitney, and she was afraid of that with, with him being such a young person, she couldn't do it because she had other kids. She talked my father into letting us move to Huntsville, where her sister was. And when we got there, suddenly there's cars everywhere. You know, we were on a gravel road where, where we lived. There's cars, there's stop signs that people ignore. There's trucks going on that. And she was busy with my younger brother and my the, her other two kids. So the solution was she bought a rope and a harness and tied me to the tree and put me outside every day for a few hours while she did her home housework. <laughs> oh, it was terrible. I'd chase those cars and I'd suddenly like that. You know what that's like. I gave your book to my daughter. Uh, she's in second year uh, university. She changed from uh, child psychology to English literature. Oh, nice. And uh, I said, you need to read this book before you go into your second uh, year of university. In fact, you should have it under your arm uh, when you walk into your first class, because if the teacher sees that, then you're, you're good. Right. And so she was reading it and she responded to me last night. She goes, yeah, your, your mom should have tied you to a tree as well. I think so. <laughs> well, hyper you, kids. You think about uh, about that. Let's let's go into your your uh, your schoolhood. Um, your 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 growing up. You had some good friends in Huntsville at, at the school. Uh, was it Brent and Eric? 
Um, yes. Did you really put condoms over the exhaust of cars? Or can they go elsewhere? <laughs> so you were a little bit of a mischief type of person <laughs> and getting into trouble and not the best grades. Made me feel good because I was terrible in school. Uh, but what changed that? It was something to do with writing. Oh, you have it. Look at that. My report card, grade 12. You've kept everything, haven't you? Oh, wow, that's fantastic. An average of 45.4%. The principal, Doug Stone, has written at the bottom here in red ink, going, going, gone. Wanted to kick me out of school, right? So I had a meeting with the principal in which he said, his advice was that I take a year off, I get a job, I work, and I think about what I want to do because this is disgraceful and you're just wasting our time and wasting your time. The English teacher came, Clyde Armstrong, and he poked his head in. Now, this is a bizarre story. He asked if he could join the meeting. The principal said, sure, of course. So Clyde Armstrong sat down and he said, I, I know what you're talking about. Royce filled me in. I'm here to ask you to let him stay this next year because I've got a plan. What plan? Well, I'm going to create a magazine and I want Roy to be the editor of it. I had 53 in English, the only course I passed except for PT. And the principal let it happen. And suddenly in the next year, I'm the editor of The Pundit and we're raising all kinds of trouble and I'm having fun and writing editorials and that. But the greatest thing was that a new girl had moved into town from St. Catharines. Her and her sister called Huntsville Hicksville. They were really, really looking down at it, but she was very pretty and very lovely. And her father was the chemistry teacher, inheriting me, the worst chemistry student of all. And uh, she signed on to the magazine as a business editor. And we spent 56 years together. And another girl signed on as the entertainment editor. It gets better. Her name's Edie Van Alstyne from nearby village of Port Sydney. And she, we became great friends. And she has edited. She, she edited a Governor General's winning book on the North about the caribou. And she's edited many of my books. So these things all came together. It's a, a serendipity beyond belief to me. And that's what started it and kept, kept me in it. Now, one thing I want to add about the, the father. <laughs> so he was also... In charge of, uh, he was the, also the char uh, the teacher in charge of careers and that, and he had access to all the information. So Alan arrived home one day when we were just early dating, and he had the IQ that you do in grade nine. He had mine laid out on the table on this side, hers laid out here, and he showed them to her and he told her, "This guy is not smart enough for you." Oh. She told me this years later. I was appalled, but you know what, Kevin? Subsequently, she and I had three very lovely girl uh, girls who became teenagers, and all of a sudden, I developed a huge admiration for him. <laughs> well, yeah, we, you get that, right? Well, did did you second guess yourself growing up though about writing, or is it was it just your thing to to save you through all the other turmoil? Well, like every kid, so many kids anyway, I planned to be a prof professional hockey player. Pretty hard to do when you're wearing Coke bottle lens glasses. And of course, I, I found out very quickly I wasn't very good because we played against a team from Perry Sound that had a kid called Bobby Orr. Have I got that right? <laughs> and it so kind of struck me that I may as well stay tied to the trees trying to become a professional hockey player. <laughs> well, what about, what about uh, your, your buddy Eric starting a riot? Well, I think you started the riot. Uh, and then all of a sudden later on, you, you wrote a screenplay and then you met Martin Short. I mean, yeah. that's a great story. Well, we were in Gravenhurst playing uh, the Gravenhurst team. And uh, <clears throat> what happened was I had a guy in the corner. I don't really think unfairly, but it was, it went up against the uh, mash. It used to be chicken wire fencing with posts in it rather than the glass that I have now. And he hit his elbow right in the out of it, ed edge of it. And he, he broke his elbow. And so he's lying on the ice and they call an ambulance. But before the ambulance could get there, his father and brothers come out of the stands and they grab sticks from the, the Gravener's team and they're coming at me swinging the sticks. Eric's at the other end. He's our goaltender. He skates the length of the ice and he takes out the dad with, with his elbow and flees. And he in full hockey equipment, he runs across the concrete floor of, of the uh, tuck shop area, out into the parking lot and locks himself in a car. We have no backup goalie. End of game. 
get a police escort out of town. I wrote a, a screenplay many, many years later uh, called uh, about the about my book, based on my book, somewhat the last season. And uh, <laughs> they cast Martin Short, his first movie he was ever in. And uh, he was made the, the goaltender, Weepy. And we put that scene exactly as, as it happened up back in Gravener's 30 years earlier. We put it into the movie. That's and like, I met Martin Jordan later, and uh, I asked him, I said, I, 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 I was at an event where he was at, and I said, hey, Weepy, how's it going? Because that's the nickname that the goalie had. And he turns around, he says, where'd you get that? I said, and I introduced myself. He said, oh, my God. He said, that was so fun working on that movie. It's a small world, right? Now, was it Brent or Eric that caught his uh, penis in the zipper on the first day of school? Brent. Yeah. Okay. And as I was able to put into the book, I said, it would not be the last time that Brent's weenie would get him in trouble. And <laughs> I thought, I better run this by his family. So he, Brent had a pretty rough life. He he found sober, sobriety. He found Emerald, a beautiful woman that he married. And uh, they were doing quite well. He passed away suddenly at age 54, heart failure. But I had written this and I, I asked Emerald if, if I had her permission to run this in the book. I also asked his sister, Judy, and both of them said, that was Brent. Run it, go with it. Well, I'm going ahead of myself, too, uh, going way off script here or whatever, but but I, I love the part in your book where you went over all the people you knew throughout your life. It's near the end of the book, and I love that section because yeah. I, I hardly knew any of them, but but the, the relationship you had with them throughout your life was re really great, especially your friends from school and especially the you know issues they dealt with in life. Yes. I thought that was really fantastic. And is it true that um, that a, a true writer needs to experience life, needs to travel, needs to do everything to soak that, all that in? Are you the person that sits and watches and then writes? Is that what a true writer is? Well, I think you can connect me back to the tree there that I am watching. And, and I write about this thing in the book, which I call exper experiential journalism. In other words, get involved. I basically came to the conclusion that the, the least important thing that I would do in writing a feature about someone is to sit down and have an interview with them. But I would do it because they would expect it, right? Let's still do it. What I really wanted to do was disappear. So I would do something with them. I would ask whatever they're doing, wherever they're going, and can I hang around? And they would often forget that I was a journalist, maybe taking notes in that. And so they would become more like themselves and, and let me really find out things. There's one little area in the book where I talk about uh, writing about Timothy Findlay and we had done the interview and uh, you know like some nice stuff came out it's about his book on the wars and they said after well I still had some time let's go for a walk around the farm that he and Bill were living on at the time and we get out there and he says you see these fields here he said you know two summers ago when we had all those rains I came out here and it was so muddy and I thought this is what they faced in the first world war when they were down in down in the mud and the trenches and that. And so I went back and I put some old clothes on and I come out here and I dove into the mud and I crawled around in it until I thought I could feel how suffocating, how frightening, how terrifying and how cold it must have been for these men. And I was able to write about it. To me, that's experiential journalism. Yeah, that's true writing. And, and, and also of all the prime ministers you interviewed, like you spent a lot of time with them as well. I, I love that part of the book where you really spent solid time with them. I think that's why you got some some good insight. What was the most unique time with which prime minister? What was this sort of like, gosh, I can't believe I'm here and I can't believe I'm getting this story? <laughs> well, I suppose when I worked with uh, Stephen Harper on his hockey book, which was not a journalism assignment, it was something that, that happened later on. I wrote a chapter about this and then I ran it by Mr. Harper. And he, he gave me, he laughed and gave me permission to run it. And what it was that I got a call from my agent, Westwood Agency in Toronto, and said that they had a confidential project to discuss with me. Would I swear to not tell anyone about what this is about? And I said, well, sure. It's just about Prime Minister Harper. His hobby at night is working on a book about the early days of professional hockey, you know, 1915, 1916, Toronto area. And uh, he needs some help organizing it. He would write his own book, and he did write it. But I, I would be kind of an editor supervising it. And we went and met and we did not get along, it seemed. I was I came home and told Ellen that same time, there's no job there for me. And, and then I got a call back to the prime minister's office and he had taken every point that I had made and he had checked it off and disagreed with it. And I noticed I kept saying, talking about the narrative arc 
of what this book should be like. And every time I used the word narrative, it seemed like he flinched. And I came to realize that in Ottawa, sometimes words become, take on meanings that aren't what they're meant to be. Narrative in Ottawa these days is either my lie or your lie. You know, that's your narrative. That's the narrative. And, and that's not the way the word's supposed to be at all. So I just stopped talking about narrative. And we began looking for an idea for the book that would kind of carry it through. And we found, I found this character I mentioned in the book called John Ross Robertson, who was a very influential publisher and very much against professional hockey. But he was extremely eccentric. He would go to several funerals a week, for example, of people he didn't know in Toronto just to be at funerals. And I thought, guys, this character is too rich. And I talked to Mr. Harper about it. I was up at Harrington Lake at the time with him. And Ellen and I were there for an afternoon lunch and some work. And I mentioned it. He says, well, I have an old book on John Ross Robertson. Let's go get it. So the next thing you know, there's four black suburbans lined up at Harrington Lake. The Mounties are in them. They're revving the engines. The Prime Minister gets in one of them. And I'm told to follow. I have a 2007 Explorer. It's 10, 15 years old at that time. It's rickety, and they're flying down the Meech Lake Road at ridiculous speeds, gravel spewing all over the place. They get on to number five, and they go into assassination evasive moves. In other words, they're going down, and they're shifting like this all the time, all the way down the highway. I say, oh, what the hell am I going to do here? Well, you better do what they're doing. So I start doing this. <laughs> and there's a car right in behind me, pulls up right behind me, a silver Jeep. And I think, I cut this guy off. I know just a few minutes ago, he's mad. He's trying to get me. So we go over the bridge. We turn into 24 Sussex. The silver Jeep moves in right behind me. Another mount he gets out. He was strategically placed along the, the way to join us. And the most ridiculous part of that story was we were working late in the night. I was on the phone here. He was on the phone in 24 Sussex, and we're getting close to the end of the book. And we're talking and talking and talking, and the phone's ringing in the background. He says, I have to get this. Oh, of course, you know, you're the prime minister. So I just, I can hear some mumbling, mumbling, and then I hear a click. He comes back and he says, that's never happened before. That phone's never rung. I said, what phone? He said, the phone, the phone, you know, the nuclear phone. So <laughs> we're working away again. I I told him he had the wrong number and uh, we're working away again. The phone starts ringing again. I think, oh my God, the missiles are in the air. So he goes over and he answers it and he comes back and he's laughing. He says, it was the same guy. He didn't believe me. <laughs> well, did, did, did those stories come home with you? Uh, did you all of a sudden sit down with Ellen at, at night and sort of, you wouldn't believe what happened to me today or oh, yeah. she was with you at the time? Or, or did you just go into your office uh, 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 as a hermit and just write these things up? Because you wrote a no. column every day for many years. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I uh, five columns a week for five years at the Globe and Mail, and uh, Pierre Burton did uh, five columns a week for three years at the Toronto Star. It was all uh, that was always held up to be the most amazing amount of column. Right? And not to say anything negative about Pierre Burton at all, but it just shows you that it can be done. Yeah, did it? Did it? Well, obviously, it didn't go every day. Like you, 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 you obviously didn't have this epiphany every single day. But can you name maybe three uh, of those pieces that you were so excited to put out, but then nobody really read? <laughs> oh, there'd be lots of them, wouldn't there? And in fact, uh, and you'll relate to this. I can find pieces that I wrote twenty years ago that I can't recognize. Like I don't remember writing that. Do you ever get that? <laughs> People will remind me, and I go, no, no. I'm going to go have a drink now, if you don't mind. <laughs> All right, so I'm going off tangent here. All right, you're bad school. You know, oh, yeah, you travel a lot. Um, the riot. Um, oh, yeah. I love this story. The first time you wanted to write about Tom Thompson, and you brought it to McLean's, right? The, the, um, and they sort of said, yeah, whatever. What made it happen? What made a funny the story, which you actually you know, created an incredible book about, what yeah. finally got that? Uh, uh, for people to read? Well, I, my opportunity to join McLean's, Peter Newman made it quite clear, was if I could produce a piece on Tom Thompson. I had a family connection in that uh, Tom Thompson's girlfriend, Winifred Trainer, was the sister of my great uncle's, uh, my great uncle Roy, uh, who, who had married Marie Trainer. And so Winnie was the sister, but spinster sister who kind of adopted our family, would come up to our house and that very, very strange woman, very opinionated, could get quite angry. 
And uh, so I, I had helped clean out her cottage in 1962 after she passed away. I was only 14 years old. And all of her stuff went to my cousin, Terry, who inherited everything, including 12, 13 or 14 Tom Thompson originals. Imagine what they were worth then. She kept them in a six quart basket, by the way, because they were little sketches. And when she'd go away to visit anywhere, she'd march them across the street to Addie Sylvester, another spinster who worked as the Bell telephone operator. And Addie'd say, she'd hand me this box of paintings and I'd just throw it behind the wood stove and not even think of it again. Now those on, on auction, those go for $2 million plus each. Anyway, she, Winifred didn't even have, she didn't even have running hot water in her house or in her apartment. Let me tell you that. She had a space heater. She didn't have central heating. She had nothing. She could have had all these things. So McLean said, well, if you can produce this, get those paintings for us, we'd love to run them. So I tried, but I couldn't really get anywhere with my, uh, my cousin. And then I started talking to people about Tom Thompson and where he was really buried. Is he at Canoe Lake, as many, many people believe, as I believe? Or he's at Leith, where a lot of people go and pay homage to his, his uh, stone there and leave coins on it and things like that. And then I interviewed a guy who lived all his life at Canoe Lake called Jimmy Stringer. And Jimmy, I met him at the Empire Hotel in Huntsville, and he kept sending me over for $2.65 bottles of sherry, which he would down as we talked. And then he said, and he always called me Laddie. So we'd known that family forever and ever. I tell you what, Laddie, there's not two graves. There's three. Before the undertaker came to exhume the body back in 1917, me and some of the lads, we went up and dug them up and we put them elsewhere. And that's why the casket that got sent back to Leith had nothing but some gravel in it. It didn't weigh much. Oh, I got so excited. So next day, Jimmy gets up. Oh, and he says, uh, he says, and I've got Tom Thompson shin bone in my, in my shed. I'll show it to you. As soon as the snow goes out, it was a thaw on at the time. As soon as the snow's all gone, I'll show you the shin bone and we'll go and I'll show you exactly where Tom Thompson's really buried. Now, Kevin, don't misunderstand me. I, I think Tom I, and, and Jimmy's kind of shooting the bull at this point about the third grave. But this really did happen. The next morning he gets up, he gets his groceries at the A&P, takes a cab out to the Portage store at Canoe Lake where he's going to be able to haul his toboggan across the lake back to the home that he shared with his brother Wham. Wham Stringer. He gets partway across the lake. Remember I said there was a thaw on? The ice gives away, and Jimmy Stringer dies just about the same spot as Tom Thompson rose. That's a true story. Chilly, right? So yeah. I wrote this stuff up, and McLean thought that was a pretty neat story, and they ran it, and that was the beginning of the Tom Thompson adventure for me. Not that I was the first. I was far from the first to write about Tom Thompson. I'll be far from the last. But I will... I welcome every story about Tom Thompson. I just think some of them are so wonderful. There's even a guy who wrote uh, a part of a book. He's a bit of a weather expert saying that it was a rare and unusual water spout that picked Tom Thompson up from the <laughs> waters of Canoe Lake, took him up into the air, spun him around, which is why there was fishing line wrapped around his ankle, smashed his head on the bow of the, the canoe. The canoe went down upside down and Tom went down and plunged to the bottom of Canoe Lake. There's so much written about him. Um, I, I, I love your writing, so I've always liked yours. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to keep to the script here because I want to sort of, so um, there's, a, there's an opening paragraph of Bruce Hutchison's uh, book, Unknown Country, published in, in 1942. He said, it's, it, it is strength and weakness, despair and joy, and the wild confusions and restless strivings of, of a boy who has passed his boyhood, but is not yet a man. And he talked about that as Canada in 1942 would you say that's the same no no first of all it's not a boy and a man anymore it's men and women and they long since grew up but have they really grown up so that his his vision is that it's it's almost like a warlike warrior vision of this powerful person growing up and maturing well if if we're now mature, you know, what, 80 years later, we're now those that mature man, we're not, we're men and women, you know, what was the convoy all about? What What is the current political snarkiness all about? I think we've got a lot of growing up still to do. That's fantastic. They, um, they, the other book that you uh, mentioned, oh, my Lord, here it is. Um, oh, no, I should keep the script. Um, oh, uh, Margaret Atwood's um, 
partner. Graham Gibson. Yes, yes. His his book, Do You Had Under His Arm? Uh, under yep. Your Arm, sorry. Uh, that inspires you as, as a young reader and writer. Uh, can you tell that story? Well, I was still in high school. and No, I was just starting university. Went down to Toronto to the, the uh, famous bookstore that was down there in, in the uh, Yorkville area. And I bought uh, Five Legs, which was Graham Gibson's new novel, which was supposed to be quite uh, inventive and that. I was reading, uh, you know, the, the various writers of the time, Jack Kerouac and that. And I, <clears throat> so I bought this Graham Gibson book. And then my uh, friend, Ralph, uh, who became my brother-in-law, and I, we were staying at his grandmother's place. We stopped at the Birch Avenue Brewers Retail, as they were called, then to buy some beer. And we're walking into the store, and Graham Gibson's walking out of the store with his beer, beer and an old burlap sack. He's got some beer. And I said, are you Graham Gibson? Yeah. I said, well, I've just bought your book. <laughs> so he signed it. And it kind of it, it, it intrigued me enough. I got to know him quite well over the years because twice they assigned me to do uh, long profiles on his wife, Margaret Atwood. And then once I was assigned to do a long profile on him, he had a, he very much wanted to be a major Canadian literary figure. His books were sometimes panned, sometimes embraced, but he never really reached that threshold of being a major, major Margaret Lawrence, Margaret Atwood, I figure, except he did. His contribution was in the Writers Union of Canada in getting fair shakes for, for, for people that do write and create in the Canada Council, for example, like that. He stands today as a pivotal person in Can, Can Lit. Not the way he envisioned, but he's there. That's interesting. I love that part about, about uh, uh, Canadian literature in, in your entire book. And, I, you know, it's funny. Um, I got so excited when your book came out, and I shared it to a bunch of my friends, my canoe friends, and I think they just thought it was a canoe book. <laughs> and I went, okay, when did I ever say it was a canoe book? It's a memoir about a really well-known Canadian writer. Yeah, there's a lot of writing in this, Kevin. Oh, my God. <laughs> and when the book came out, did did you have a separate fan base? Did you have a lot of people thinking, is it life in the bush? Is it is about Tom Thompson? Or did you have a lot of your colleagues rejoice about the book coming out because it was about the life they saw you every single day at, at McLean's, at Globe and Mail, at all those other... Um, places. I think I've been uh, difficult to brand all my life. Uh, manager of a bookstore, uh, a Coles bookstore, Catherine Wiley, she once told me, your books are all over my store, you know. Every other author, they're in the same slot in that, but you've got books, children, uh, adventure canoeing, hockey. I remember once I was at a, at an event at uh, in, in uh, Burlington, different drummer books, and there was another quite well-known Canadian writer there. And you know what he asked me? He, I, I guess I was promoting a life in the bush at the time or something like that. He asked me, he said, does it bother you at all that there's a sports writer out there with your insane name? Uh, no, it doesn't bother me because that would be me. <laughs> and I think that a lot of book author too. Like, yeah, I love that whole chapter about you getting um, your, uh, your pension because of all the children's books you you, you wrote in that that time so oh but yeah we're running out of time so i got two really important questions to ask uh, blah, 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 blah. so you said um uh on the the chapter of finger loss in the in the north atlantic um okay it was an uh, uh, it was an object lesson for feature writing the assignment is the imagining of the story the telling of the reality it rarely if ever happens that the story outlined in an office or a memo turns out exactly as planned. Is that what Absolutely. writing is about? Yes, yeah. And that's where we go back to experiential journalism. I might have a notion in my mind about somebody or something that I'm writing about, but it's when I'm there and when I see it with my own eyes rather than with my imagination that I see what, what it is and what I should be writing about. And it can often change dramatically. So that's exactly why I loved your writing growing up. Um, not that you're old and I'm old, but I, I grew up writing, uh, reading your stuff and I go, this guy can write. Uh, and I loved it. I, I love the idea of other people telling stories and you can tell a story and that's fantastic. The one thing that I just loved in the book as well is when you changed the tides of, uh, of the world, when you made the canoe, the, uh, the seventh ah. wonder of the world, and, and you, you went to Thunder Bay right afterwards. How did that happen? And, and of course you you were hated well not hated but you were disliked when you went to oh i was i was hated by a few 
it, the CBC ran a contest about the seven wonders of Canada, and I was one of three panelists choosing. And uh, the Sleeping Giant had been recommended by more people than any other object in the country. It should, should have been on that list, but because people got so protective about other things, Niagara Falls, the Rockies, that kind of thing, prairie skies. I had argued all along that the canoe is the perfect wonder of Canada because it doesn't, it, see, they wanted a geographical uh, I, breakdown so that the whole country was was connected. I said the canoe is the perfect metaphor for that because it's everywhere. Maybe a different kind of vessel up in the far, far north, but the canoe is perfect. And I won the argument. But something had to be dropped. And guess what it was? It was the Sleeping Giant. And so I I had already agreed to go to a book festival up there. And I I land in uh, Thunder Bay with Ellen and my wife and we're met by a television crew. I want to find out what, what, the, what the hell are you doing? What are you daring to stick your nose in here? But they were really good about it. The town council, I gave it a little presentation and then the councillor came up and made a presentation with a framed portrait of the Sleeping Giant. <laughs> now that was so cute and so so Canadian actually. But yeah, I'm the guy who killed the sleeping giant. I, I love that story. <laughs> it's great. Because it shows you, um, you, you can't see that coming. Uh, and then you write a good a piece about it. I, I, I love it. All right. So you wrote a memoir. Um, now, are people going around thinking this is your last piece because it's a memoir? Or is this just the beginning for you? No, I think that people do think that. I think that they, you know, you're summing up your life. Uh, he, he went from being tied to a tree to being... <laughs> Let's not even think about it. <laughs> and, uh, but there will be something else. I'll find a new project. Um, I'll do. I'd like to do some more stuff for kids. Uh, there's still topics out there that interest me. But uh, you know, I think this is book number seventy or something. So it's really almost spun out of control. I know you. You're making me inspire. I got to write another book. <laughs> <laughs> well, cheers to you, sir. Uh, a fantastic book. I loved it. Um, to the point that you know i do a, a lot of reviews for a lot of books and i i i took me a while to read this and my partner christine goes you got to read the book you got to write you got to write with this i went no you're taking time take it <laughs> so yeah i love uh, reading it and mm -hmm. loved it and i do know that you will have another book out because you're a writer you're a canadian writer and we don't retire cheers sir cheers <laughs>